After almost seven years and countless reviews, few headsets still make me sit up and take notice like this one. The Quest 3 isn't just a VR headset, it's a turning point in the VR narrative. But as we venture into this new chapter, does it hold its ground and should you buy one? Now I've had it for a few days, but I also had several chances to test this out prior to this. So after hours and hours spent, I'm ready to give you my final review where we go in depth about the specs, everything I like and don't like. Thanks to Meta for the early review unit, however no money was exchanged and they're seeing this video at the same time as you are, they wanted honest feedback which I intend to deliver. To show our gratitude to you, we bought a headset to give away, to enter check the link below and if you're still burning with questions after this video, join our live stream right after this. Alright, let's dive straight into the meat of things, what's in the box? The Meta Quest 3 represents Meta's latest stride in VR, being the third Quest iteration and the seventh VR headset from what we knew as the Oculus lineage. Can you believe how time flies? The box, it's sleeker, minimalistic, purely functional, a tad bland for my taste, but hey, it's what's inside that counts, right? Inside we've got the MetaQuest 3 headset with the new Y-splitted soft strap, a pre-installed adjustable facial interface, a pair of the new Touch Plus controllers with batteries included, an 18 watch power adapter, a USB-C charging cable, and of course the usual paperwork. Driving this VR headset is Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 paired with 8 gigs of RAM. The visuals are crisp due to the dual LCD displays with 2064 times 2208 pixels for each eye. And the new pancake lenses are what makes it possible for the headset to be so much slimmer than its predecessor. Power-wise, it houses a 5060 mAh battery, it's Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth ready with a USB-C port for your audio charging and data transfer needs. For tracking, four optical sensors are now on the front and sides. But new on this headset are the 4 megapixel RGB cameras plus a depth sensor for a more realistic mixed reality experience. Oh, and those strap speakers? They are upgraded for better spatial audio. Now, while it comes with two new controllers, you can still go controller free with hand tracking. The Quest 3 launches tomorrow on October 10, and you can get the 128 gigs at $500 and 512 gigs for $650. Early birds ordering any model before January 27th get Ascar's Wrath 2 for free, which is one of the most anticipated VR games right now. And for those going big with the 512 gig, you get a six month MetaQuest Plus trial in included. No worries, we'll dive deeper into each of these specs right now, starting with the very first thing that catches the eye, the design makeover and comfort. The Quest 3 is notably slimmer than its predecessor Quest 2. It not only looks sleek but feels solid and sturdy. However, a word of caution, the white exterior can pick up marks easily, I already noticed some mysterious black spots. I'm not sure how they got there. To the left you got the 3.5mm audio jack, on the right, there's your charging port and power button. And down below, you find the manual IPD slider, charging dock connectors, and volume buttons. Speaking of IPD, there's good news. Unlike the Quest 2's three-point system, the Quest 3 offers a flexible slider to adjust lens spacing, accommodating a wider range between 53 to 75 millimeters. Interestingly, despite its slimmed down design, the Quest 3 is a smidge heavier than the Quest 2. 461 grams compared to 458. But its design distributes weight more evenly and since it's closer to the face, it's noticeably comfier. I even managed the soft strap comfortably for full two hour sessions. Ponytail wearers will appreciate the split opening for added comfort. However, I still experience some forehead strain, so I'm getting the elite strap, but everyone's comfort varies, so I recommend testing the default first. A tiny nitpick, the face cover no longer comes with a nose flap, causing some light leakage at the bottom. 
For me, this isn't a deal breaker as it helps me see where I'm standing and sometimes this little guy comes to say hi. But for those who miss it, third party accessories might be your best bet in the future. Meta is launching its own set of accessories now including a carrying case, charging dock, active straps for the controllers, silicone facial interface, prescription lens adapters, a lead strap with and without a battery pack, plus the standard white soft strap is now available in blue and orange. With a larger facial interface, these color options add a fun personal touch to your headset. But take note, the Quest 2 straps won't fit the Quest 3 due to the redesign. Though adapters or 3D printed solutions could bridge this and expect more third-party accessories soon. I'll highlight my picks on this channel, so subscribe, please. Adjusting the eye relief is now simpler. Press a button inside the headset to adjust the face cover's distance from the lenses. Closer gives a wider view to view, while further provides more room for glasses. No more looking for that glasses spacer, I always lost that thing. For those with prescriptions, I suggest opting for the uh, lens adapter so you don't need to wear glasses in the headset. When you finally turn on the headset, you'll be quickly guided through a smoother setup process, thanks to Meta's consistent improvements. Booting up sends you directly into the Quest OS. In case you're wondering, since all Quest headsets use the same software and ecosystem, there is backwards compatibility with all current Quest games and apps. One of the biggest changes, the new pass-through mode. And now, after the initial setup, you start in this mode, allowing you to see your actual surroundings through the headset. This is also called mixed reality, and it's now in full color, which is a massive upgrade from Quest 2's grayscale view. Plus, thanks to its new depth sensor, Quest 3 can scan and map out your space, setting up your play boundary or guardian swiftly. I'm impressed at how fast it is. However, my first demos seemed sharper than my at-home experience. I found that's because the pass-through quality is heavily influenced by lighting. Dim settings create more visual noise, but bright lights showcase its true potential. It's still not lifelike quality, with some noise, slight distortion and latency, but it's much sharper than its predecessors and other competitors, like the Quest 2 or Pico 4. The full color vision combined with the depth projector does wonders for spatial recognition. You can walk around your home seamlessly or even grabbing a drink without ever leaving the matrix. That sounded a little bit more scary than I thought it would be. But you can even read briefly through this mode, although it's still blurry, it is handy for a quick task, say replying to a quick text. Keep in mind that this is just about to pass through, clarity in VR is a whole different ball game, but we'll get into that shortly. The new color pass through is a game changer for mixed reality possibilities. You can see virtual characters chilling on your chair or hiding behind it. Or you your walls transforming into windows, making you feel like you're amidst a zombie apocalypse. Ever fancied learning the piano? An app overlays virtual notes on your real piano and it works. Or a picture a dynamic board game right on your table? Quest can actually sync up game spaces for local multiplayer, which gives real augmented reality vibes. Something else that got me excited about this tech is using it as a productivity tool. While drafting this script, I needed to check something in VR, so I placed the menu next to my laptop. I mean, it's not perfect yet, but it felt futuristic. However, as excited as this all makes me, there is a caveat. MR's potential feels underutilized currently. Few apps genuinely leverage the environment beyond serving as mere backdrops. There's also much to be improved, like I would love to see hand occlusion. Right now, if you move your hands in front of an object, it doesn't look realistic. Here's what realistic occlusion could look like with the Lynx R1. Quest 3 may also have this ability, but will depend on whether developers do something with it. I am excited about Meta's augments coming next year. Think of them as digital objects you can place in your house, like game trophies, animated posters, or videos. They will be in the same place every time you wear your headset. The idea of Cherry and I redesigning our own versions of our spaces and then showing it off to each other? Epic, but it's still in the pipeline, so I'm not sure if I'm just fantasizing. Not to mention, there's a looming privacy question. What data does Meta collect about our spaces? As much as I love VR, we should be wary of 
potential data intrusion. So maybe it's time to hide your dirty laundry. Anyways, while the allure of MR is undeniable, it is time we talk about the real essence of this headset VR. Say hello to the Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 chipset, which gives double the GPU processing power than Quest 2. This translates to a noticeable leap in performance. Games on Quest 3 load a solid 10 to 30% quicker based on my test with three different titles. And some developers have been quick to retrofit games to harness Quest 3's expanded capacities. This could manifest as higher quality textures, enhanced sharpness, better level of detail, dynamic shadowing, or simple things like increased foliage density. However, game enhancements come down to developers update them so it might take a while for some titles or they might not come at all. Developers might choose to keep Quest 2 graphics optimizations as it still has a large user base, although I hope not. Now a uh, clarification is in order. Contrary to my initial impressions, the 72Hz option hasn't been axed while the headset adapts to 90Hz and 120Hz when compatible apps require it, it can still run in 72Hz. I'm sorry about that mistake, but thank you all for your feedback. Overall, games feel smoother and the enhancements on Quest 3 had me genuinely marveling at what's possible now on a standalone headset. But as anticipated, the battery life sees a minimal improvement. Even though Quest 3 has more capacity than its uh, predecessor, the advanced hardware guzzles more power, so my full trial run clocked in at roughly 2 hours and 18 minutes, though I was recording for half that duration. Depending on your activity, you might stretch it to an absolute max of a little less than 3 hours. Given this duration, if you like long gaming sessions, considering a strap equipped with an extra power bank might be wise. Charging takes about 2.5 hours via the provider's 18 watch adapter. Meanwhile, these uh, controllers, they haven't run out on me yet. Now onto my favorite part of a headset review, the visual clarity. The Quest 3's resolution isn't actually a huge bump in pixels compared to Quest 2. But what makes a big difference in sharpness are the new lenses. The headset now claims that the highest pixel density in the Quest lineup, 25 pixels per degree. Not the highest in any VR headset, but it's a huge step up in clarity. There's minimal glare and god rays, and the screen door effect is gone. There's a larger sweet spot, making it easier to find the sharp center, and I'm impressed at the edge-to-edge -edge clarity. The vibrancy of the colors and contrast levels see a notable uplift compared to Quest 2, although the black tones remain gray due to the LCD displays. But 4K movies are a treat to watch on this headset, the resolution really does them justice. Intriguingly, even without the local dimming found in the Quest Pro, the visuals on Quest 3 are nearly identical, but with the latter's sharpness etching out the former. I'm surprised by this, as I really thought that the local dimming would make a bigger difference. Now, this part was also a point of discussion in my previous video, because in my initial assessment, the field of view difference between Quest 2 and Quest 3 seemed subtle, because I was doing it by memory. However, with precise measurements at home, there is a distinctive improvement in Quest 3's FOV. I can see it now. Meta's claim of a 15% boost holds true, especially vertically. While I still don't think it's transformative, it undeniably reduces the binocular vision view. Plus, the current measurement is with the stock face cover. I think third-party face covers could bring you closer to the screen, which would expand the FOV. Now, as for the sound, decidedly superior. The headset straps now have two speakers, each at the top and bottom likely to amplify 3D spatial audio. Touted improvements include a 40% louder audio range, enhanced bass, and optimal left-right matching. At its loudest, it's almost overwhelming. I find that a third of the maximum volume is sufficient in quiet surroundings. Let's address the built-in microphone. Its location is now a mystery to me, but hear it out. This is what the MetaQuest 3 microphone sounds like. It is unedited and unfiltered, so you can hear exactly what it sounds like. To my ears, the microphone quality remains consistent with the previous iterations, so it's not much improved, it's just okay and enough for social interactions. Introducing ooh, the new, wow, 
the new Touch Plus controllers. Gone are the tracking rings, reducing weight. A handy addition is the quick access button for the battery cover, designed for a single AA battery. What stands out is the hybrid tracking approach. Melding computer vision with hand tracking, it gracefully handles occlusion. Like its predecessors, there are blind spots, particularly areas the internal cameras can't reach above and below the headset. Crest 3's cameras have shifted to the front as well, as opposed to the previous overhead position in Crest 2. And I noticed more sporadic losses in tracking when the controllers move overhead, like in fast-paced games as Beat Saber. It's a rare occurrence though. The Quest software predictive abilities ensure a largely uninterrupted experience. For context, certain inside-out tracking headsets struggle with overhang forward motions like here in Ubis. Quest 3 handles this nicely. Now inherited from the Quest Pro, the new controllers integrate true touch haptics. This entails three sensors on the thumb rest, the grip and the triggers. A cool feature is the index finger sensing on the triggers. I'm actually not sure if the pressure sensor on the thumb press is available given no apps use this feature yet. Nonetheless, the haptics do subtly provide more realistic feedback. If you want superior tracking, Crest 3 supports the Pro controllers. These independent devices with their own chips and cameras can track even outside the tracking range. Hand tracking is the same on Quest 2 and Pro. Over time, the technology has refined though, managing movements like finger occlusions with grace. However, the tracking range is still limited, so it's not much improved. What I do enjoy is navigating menus with my fingers, which feels so intuitive. The finger animations are well done. They kind of trick your senses into feeling haptic feedback, even though there is none. Prior to this review, I never noticed this feature and I rarely used it, but now I love it. Be aware though, it might just trigger your feline friends to the point of playful ambush. But, but, but the Quest 3's upgraded chipset also paves the way for Wi-Fi 6 d support, more video codecs and higher video bit rates. This naturally begs the question, how does it fare with streaming PC VR games? So Meta hasn't provided details for their built-in free AirLink feature, so it remains unclear if it benefits from these enhancements. However, the man of the hour, the one behind the virtual desktop, Guy Godin, is already ahead of the curve. While his app is paid, I found it consistently outshine the competition in terms of stability. With Quest 3, he added a new update that introduces AV1 video codec support up to 200 Mbps with HEVC, the powerful godlike quality setting at 120Hz and super resolution upscaling across all quality levels and it looks just oh golden labels the quest 3 as the best headset for wireless pc vr so far and my experience echoes this sentiment virtual desktop has consistently been smooth already but with quest 3 the experience feels even more so however the biggest difference is the bump in visual clarity as you can see it's beautiful a small caveat I haven't had the chance to test it with a Wi-Fi 6E router, but according to Godin, those with one can stream on an uncongested band, so this translates to a more seamless experience with minimal network-induced disruptions. Ooh, that was quite a dive, wasn't it? So let's cut to the chase. Should you get the Quest 3? Well, in a nutshell, Quest 3 certainly outshines its predecessor, Quest 2, in almost every facet. From design, processing, optics to controllers and audio. However, the biggest improvements like the mixed reality experience and graphical enhancements won't reach its full potential unless software catches up, which might take a long time. So we won't know if it holds its ground until later. Now, if you want it just for mixed reality or you've already played most VR games available, I actually don't think it's worth getting it day one. Let the market evolve, give it some months and reevaluate. But if this is your first VR headset or you just want the latest and greatest, Quest 3 is an undoubted winner. Despite its higher price point, it's a tangible leap forward in standalone VR tech and with the largest standalone content library still, Meta is leading the way. As for storage, well, my tip is to get the 512 gigs because my 128 gig version is quickly filling up already. Let me know down below if you're getting a Quest 3. If you're still considering getting one, I will put an affiliate link below. No application, but using it does give us 
a small nod of support to our channel. Now don't forget about our giveaway and live stream today, I'll link it below, and if you love the content, subscribe and join us beyond reality. This is my little doodle for you guys.